to have simple, uh, simple definitions. Effective communication is the presentation of views by the sender in a way 
best understood by the receiver. Effective communication is the presentation of views by the sender in a way best understood by the receiver. Now, I need you to, let's put this into perspective. A lot of people will say, this is the way I talk. I cannot, I cannot, I can't say better than this. This is the way I talk if you accept me like that. Particularly in relationships, we, we are very particular about having our partners accept us the way we shout, the way we don't talk, the way we are, the way we want to ghost them for two weeks, even though we live in the same house, the way we do nonsense. <laughs> no offense to you. Just like now, I was told to shift my fan, even though personally, I don't want to shift the fan. I will get hot. And I don't want to shift away from there to put on the AC because I like my background. However, I have to shift the fan because the key thing here is that I must present, I must give this presentation in the best way that makes, that would help you as the listener understand it. So whether you are having an argument with your spouse or you are trying to say something to your boss or you're talking to your child, it is for your communication, for whatever it is you're trying to tell or teach or put across to be effective, to be heard and be, to be heard well and hopefully have the change happen. You need to consider the best way that your audience understands it. So it is not about you. It's about, isn't it? Well, it's also about you, but it's also about the way, the best way to do it. So I hate it. I, ah, it annoys me to hear people say, this is the way I talk. I cannot talk better than this. You better take it or you leave it. That's the same attitude we have to practically everything in our lives. And it has to stop. Because if that way is not serving you, if that way is not effective for you, you have to change. And change is hard. Change is hard particularly when you're changing an entire uh, belief system, an entire mindset, changing, you know, because you need to first change your mindset, you need to change the way you look at the world, the way you look at matters, you need to change so many things, like you have to literally just change your entire set, set head. But that change how it is possible, and it is a lot easier than you think, and it will not happen unless you start saying, you know what, this is the way I talk, but the way I talk is not working. So what will work? Because in the end, who wins from this change? It's you. There's no point having an argument with your husband every week over the same thing and he's not listening. And then we like to say, no, he's the one that is like this. Or you have a boss who doesn't listen to you or a staff. My own used to be my staff. Like, I don't understand. I would say, ah, oh, Gen Z. It's like they give them a different brain in the world. Uh, when they were coming to the world, I like to give them one different brain that is different from us. But when I started to look inward at even me and the way I communicate, I started to see change. And it's been over a year since anybody has frustrated my life. So what are the things you need to consider to get it right? There are no one effective communication style. There's no one effective communication style because we as human beings, we're actually very unique. So there are some things that I will tell you, oh, this works for my husband, that will not work for your husband. You know, your husband uh, may be somebody whom one, you tell him two, three times in the way he likes to hear you to use your arm to rub his head, you see I've entered. And some people have husbands, that even when you bang it on the wall, it will still not work. So <laughs> there are no one style to get it right. However, there are certain principles that can be applied in every situation to achieve understanding of your ideas and the words and the meanings of those words by your audience. So we're going to do this in two parts. The first part is we'll talk about how we are getting it wrong, the things that we're doing that is making it wrong. Then we talk about how to get it right the way to talk better, listen better, and have better communications that hopefully will achieve whatever goals that you hope they will achieve. The first thing that is affecting you listening and hearing and understanding the meaning behind the words that are being spoken to you, the first thing 
uh, the most popular thing or the biggest thing that is affecting our effective communication is attitudes. Our attitudes. Our attitude to life. The way we approach things. What's that definition of attitude? Emotions like anger, sadness, change objectivity. A lot of us are not objective. In fact, I found no offense to any woman that women are not particularly very objective. And this is me from experience, understanding myself. So I'm not calling anybody out or putting you on the spot. We're not very objective people. We're very emotional. And that's our attitude. Like we look at everything from emotions, the way I feel about it. A woman doesn't approach things. No, no, no. I don't not a woman most women or most people don't approach things from what it is we usually approach it from the way i feel about it, the way you're making me feel right now and the thing about that attitude is that it is a noise in your conversation so let me give an example i am allergic to apples now my attitude to life is that it's fine that every other person can eat it i can't now, what will annoy me is if you now look at me, every time I'm telling you oh, I'm allergic to apple, I can't even be allergic to apple. Ah, how can anybody be allergic to apple? Hey, Ugao, just eat it like that. It cannot kill you. It can literally kill me. I am allergic to apple. I almost died from drinking ACV foolishly. So you know about so you are not listening to what I'm saying about the fact that I can literally die because you can't understand, it doesn't make any sense to you. You don't get it. So you feel that because it doesn't make sense to you, it means it doesn't make sense to anybody. It didn't even make sense to me either. It didn't used to, until I realized that every time I ate apple, I have blisters in my mouth. If I ate it consistently for two, three days, I could actually not get off the bed. In fact, when I took ACV because I wanted to lose weight, I was literally couldn't get up in the morning. I was saying my prayer on my bed. For one week until I thought ACV means apple cider vinegar. SubhanAllah, why am I drinking this thing? I am allergic to fresh apple. Why would it be worse with a uh, fermented apple? So sometimes when people are trying to tell us some things, we do not listen because our attitude is the way we feel about that thing it doesn't make sense to us. So it means that it doesn't make sense to everybody. So you hear cases of, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of the husband and wives who got divorced because somebody was pressing the toothpaste from the wrong end of the tube. And, you know, the first time I heard it, I kept wondering, how would an entire marriage break because of that? And then one of the things we learned in NLP is that the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. So if somebody says, I prefer that you press the tube from the bottom and you insist that lie like hey, in my father's house, you press it from anywhere. You press it from anywhere and I don't care. And you keep pressing it. That's the same attitude you are going to have in everything in, your, in the marriage. The way you will put the pot in the kitchen is still going to be that. Every time the person says, I don't like this, your attitude to what they're saying will still be the way you will react to them. You're not going to listen. What you're, what you're hearing is that this person is well, too much. What's their impression in this thing? And then you keep doing it. But like my own allergy is, so I just said, I'm allergic to apple. What I'm literally telling you is that apple can kill me. My immune system is crazy. I was going to say stupid, but then it's crazy that when I eat apple, my immune system assumes that I'm eating poison. When you're not hearing that, what you're hearing is I am weird and I'm being difficult because that's the attitude you have to people who don't do what you do or who are not like you. And then if I now have the other attitude to tell you, it's not only apples that I'm allergic to, pineapple, and uh, don't let me call myself out because some people will probably be watching, looking at me like this lady is weird, but I hope you get what I mean. Also, being nervous also is, you know, when you're very nervous, when you're always nervous, like, you know, when somebody calls you, I say, we need to talk, and your chest is already doing, oh, what is he going to say? Is he going to break up with me? Am I going to be fired? And then you go into that conversation with that fear. But so even when the person is trying to say, I'm giving you another chance, I know it. 
I know it. It is you. So that's that. Then, then another attitude that affects effective communication is our need to be right. All the control freak in the room, just do like this, I come and do, pass it. let's have a selfie. We have a need to be right. And I don't know who, I think that men have, they have it more than we do, because even my parents at their age still have that. As, <laughs> my mom was saying something yesterday, I was like, this is not, but a fight. My father is just angry that he wasn't right. Simple. And so and that can really make communication difficult and it will affect uh, your effective communication skills. And we call this emotional noise. And emotional noise is one of the biggest problems we have in communication and all relationships. So if you feel that every time somebody says a particular thing, you get angry, you need to stop saying it is about the person. It is also about you too, but I will come back to explain. Another thing, the second thing that would affect communication is language. Even though all of us are speaking the same English, the way Sister Mariam speaks about English, very, very bougie, is different from the way this father girl is speaking our own. And then there are some people who would say, oh, I can't hear what you're saying, you're talking too fast. I'm not talking too fast. You. I'm not hearing because your brain thinks that I sound different. And so what the brain does, instead of actually having you listen, your brain is shutting down to say, she's sounding different. She's sounding different. We can't hear her. We can't hear her. Because you can actually hear me if only you would listen. But the, the language barrier is coming because you assume that because I look like this, I shouldn't sound like this. And it's shocking you. And this is a truth. Now, to take it, and that's just even the intonation of my voice. The language itself, the way that I speak my English may be slightly different from the way my neighbor speaks his English. My neighbor is uh, from North Africa, for instance. So the way he talks sometimes, he was speaking the same English, but to me, it's sounding broken. And so most times when I'm talking to him or when I'm listening to him, I actually have to calm down so that I can get the words right. And some people will say, how do you hear him? Because I know that there's already a language barrier. They, even though we're speaking the same language, the, the accent and the use of language is different and it is going to affect it. So we, in the last couple of years, have learned to talk to ourselves slowly. And we haven't had any communication issues. And this one also, uh, this can seem easy, but it's very difficult if we're speaking uh, the same language or different language. Now, let's even say you now speak different language with somebody. The barrier becomes uh, bigger. So the next one is cultural noise. Cultural noise. And this is a big deal. It's a big deal if you live in Lagos where everybody comes from everywhere and all of us are just trying to fit in. When I got to Lagos in 2009, I didn't understand a lot of things. I didn't understand a lot of things. Like, I don't get you people. <laughs> and please note that I was born in Kuala State and I grew up in Ibadan, went to school in Lori. So I didn't understand how Lagos people are. Like, the way you talk, the way you abuse people is different from the way we abuse people in Ibadan. Ibadan people, we don't used to abuse people like that. The kind of abuse we, I mean, and I'm talking about verbal abuse. The kind of, you would have got it all before you realize that, huh, did that guy abuse me? Hey. Or in Lagos, you people just, like, no offense to anyone, I keep saying you people. Lagosians would just look at you and say, your face looks like ball. That's the truth. It is not something that's supposed to be painful. That's not how you abuse anyone. Where I come from, we use adjectives so that you can go home and think about it <laughs> and then it pains you more not that i'm encouraging anyone to do that i have changed i'm not awesome i don't abuse anyone anymore i speak good or keep quiet now let me give you an example of the cultural noise that affected me particularly the most profound or one of the most profound uh, ways that cultural noise affected my communication so i used to live with my friend's mother in Suli. And my friends and her mother, and their mother. So I remember that I there was a particular woman in that compound that didn't used to greet me. She, well, she used she didn't used to greet me. She didn't she didn't seem like she liked me. And I don't understand. 
the way I saw it was that this woman is eccentric. Whatever is doing, whatever is wrong with her, has nothing to do with him. And it didn't help that she did. She does similar things to other people. So I would just greet her and go away. So one day, I said I, I greeted her, and she didn't answer. Or she answered. I can't remember. And then she called me and said, "You, you don't even greet anyone." And I said, "I greet you all the time." So is that how to greet? I'm like, I'm confused. It is asleep. I saw my come one floor. I said, and I said, okay, I'm really sorry, ma. And I walked away. So I went to my friend's uh, mom and I said, can you imagine? That woman said I don't greet her. I've been greeting her for like the last five years. How will she say I don't greet her? That do she now said, eh, what kind of greeting? The, my friend's mom now said, what kind of greeting do you greet her? You just greet her salam alaikum. Question up. You will not put ma at the back of it. You just, you will not even bend. You just walk and go away. And I was shocked. I looked at her. I've lived with this woman for five years. And she kept saying something about how that is very arrogant of me. I have an arrogant way of greeting. I just said the Taslim. I don't put ma or sa at the back. I, that is quite, and to her, she translated it as arrogant. And I looked at her and I said, you know that I'm not an arrogant person. And so why don't you greet with Ma? And I'm like, I don't greet with Ma because in my head, where I come from, you just say salam alaikum. And if you want to use Ma, eka aroma. Ma is, English, is for your greetings. Salam alaikum, the prophet didn't put Ma or Sa at the back of it. And so it didn't make any sense to me to be saying salam alaikum Ma. If I want to say Ma, I'll say salam alaikum or eka aroma. And the woman was shocked, she said, <laughs> I, I think he thought I was foolish. Like, what? And he said, that's the way I interpreted it in my head. That it is, the slim is in Arabic and the greeting is perfect the way it is. It's even a prayer. Why am I saying Aba in Kuma? I said, no, in Lagos, you put Ma at everything, whether you're speaking English or Yoga or anything. And that's how I've changed. And today, I put Ma to everything. Everything. Give me any prayer. I will go to my about it. And because apparently what happened is that culturally, we're looking at it differently. It's the same thing. I, my intention was not to be arrogant. What was there in my, that I need to be arrogant about? So cultural noise is key. Uh, and it is not just about if you are having a conversation with somebody from a different tribe or you're married to a different tribe. No, sometimes even when you're married to, I'm from Kwara, so um, if you're married to somebody from Kwara, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will still look at the world differently. Somebody who grew up in Iloi, and somebody, I was born in Opa, grew up in Ibado. There's still a different way that I look at the world from a very Ibado way. It's still Kwara in a way, because I'm a Kwara girl, everybody by us is Kwara, but it doesn't necessarily mean that my husband from Loi and then will look at the world the same way. So there will be cultural noise and you can access your relationship and your communication and check whether that's the case. The next one is physiological barrier. In fact, uh, when we're looking at barriers of communication, we usually say environmental and uh, emotional, physiological, all of these. Physiological barriers are just physical things that could be standing in the way. And it's not any spiritual anything, it's just ill health. Somebody who has malaria, or somebody who deals with migraine, for instance, may will not hear whatever you're saying while they're having their migraine episode. If I have, when I have migraine, I will need to put up the lights, put up everything. So somebody is chatting me on WhatsApp and it's angry that I'm not replying. I it hurts to look some to look at my phone. It hurts to look at the phone because the light is a trigger for the edit. And so you can't, people like, oh, I sent a message to this, they never understand that. That's why I don't like talking to you. My sister, I already know for me. Poor eyesight, too. You'll be shocked at, you know, you have people who say, oh, Julo, oh, wow. somebody's looking at you and they're not seeing you. And the sad thing is that they may, they may not be necessarily hearing you either. Because sometimes they are sort of like very connected. Hearing difficulties is legit. So let me give an example of a friend. I have this set of friends that were in ECOM and initially they were not friends. And the case was my friend had a teacher who also went in ECOM and a sister was telling her one day that um, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Zakaria. I hate that mood. I can't see it. I really appreciate the advice, though. Thank you. So my friend, my friend's sister was telling us how the other friend doesn't greet her. Every time I greet her, she doesn't answer. How uh, uh, can somebody not be answering to Teslim, but her sister in the club? Mm -hmm. If you don't answer anything, how can I say Teslim to you and you will not answer? And so the other person went to confirm, uh, uh, every time my sister greets you, you don't even answer her. Every time. And she said, ah, ha, ha, I will not answer your sister. I answer, happy each day. She said, ah, she says, she has never, you would never answer that before. She now said, hey, wait, oh, is it, it could be that every time I meet your sister, she's always greeting me from this side of my face. I said, what happened? I don't hear on this side of the face. No matter how loud you are, from this side, I can't hear you. And the person said, how didn't I notice? She said, because most times what she does is to read lips when your sister is wearing a cup. So I can't read her lips and I can't assume that she's reading me because I can't see her face. And it was a shocker. Like, are you for real? And that was it. Interestingly though, uh, the other friend's husband is a doctor, so she said they should, she should come to the hospital and let them check it. And they found out that she wasn't actually deaf on the other here. So it was actually uh, hardening wax, uh, wax that's blocked her here. <laughs> and they removed it and now she can hear on both sides. So physiological barriers are real. And I think that the lesson we take from some of the stories and knowing this barrier is that we need to be patient with people. We need to stop making assumptions. We need to stop making assumptions. We jump into conclusions. Ah, she not answer me. Oh, my, you are arrogant. She just greet me like that. She not even bow. Yes, I am Alison now. I don't bow. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I don't want to. Well, I just don't. And then I think this is the last one. Uh, and beauty and, abstra and abstraction overuse. You know. And this is some. This is particularly very generational. So, what we mean by ambiguity and abstraction? The use of abstract and saying things I've said. Some of us will say, "When I said, she you no know, no, you don't know no the meaning." See me, me. I'm one of the worst people to use uh, to use euphemism and in words for. Even though I understand them, but I hate them. Don't use in your notes for me. Don't go around the bush. Just come out and say, Muti, I don't like what you are doing. Don't come and say, eh, that's how somebody will now, some people will now, some people will now. It doesn't make any sense. I think that this comes from the fear of disappointment, from our fear of confrontation. See, things the way they are. Stop using, imagine I'm Yoruba now, I will not start doing your way, uh, using Yoruba idioms for an evil person. You don't understand it, it doesn't make any sense in their language. It's the same thing, the way you talk to your kids and you're like, why didn't you see, didn't you see my face when I said it? You not know what I'm trying to say. I don't know what you're trying to say. Say it clearly. Sometimes we use slangs. So now all of us know that when somebody says, oh, 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 I'm like, it means that you are awesome and you're psyching me. Now, the one that usually confuses me is wow, the word wow, and then wahoo. And when I use wahoo, for instance, I'm using it for something that's shocking me negatively. And apparently, wahoo is actually for something that's like, oh, oh, it's a wahoo, well done, babe. And I'm confused. Why is it? Why can't it just be wow? Wahoo is supposed to be like, hmm, hmm, you did that, wahoo. <laughs> so I know the real meaning is supposed to be synonymous to wow, but I just think they're supposed to be opposite. And that's the way I use it. And so sometimes you use slangs, uh, idioms, and half languages, and half said words, half said words in particular. Particularly when you've been trying to tell the person something and you assume that she I told you yesterday, she should not know. I don't know. The way I look at the world is different from the way you look at the world. What makes complete sense to you, it may be scattered for me. I don't know. So you need to stop generalization. You need to stop. Don't generalize. Don't assume. My father has, has this thing where he quotes this Ghanaian, uh, he quotes this Ghanaian program. And it's always very odd. Because 
he was the one who grew up in Ghana, him and his wife. We were born here. And a lot of, he would say it so long, so many times, every time you say this, I would just be looking at him, trying to understand the context. And then one day I said, what exactly does this mean? And then he told me this long story of a farmer who got his boom. And that was the, it was after I finished the story that the adage made sense to me. So every time he uses the adage now, I understand it now. Before I just used to look at him like this one is wicked. He's always making jest of me every time I say I'm not doing something. So the use of app languages and uh, over generalization, assuming that your audience should know what it is that you know, it's a barrier in, it's a barrier in, in communication. And it's something that you need to start thinking about. The slangs that people in Lagos are familiar with may not necessarily be something that people in Lohan are familiar with. So for instance, I use this Yoruba word a lot, Aketa. And it's a alluring uh, word in a way. And every time I use it, a lot of people that I'm speaking to in Lagos don't get it. They don't get it. And it's odd. It's, I always thought, isn't the meaning very clear? Keta. Like the person is being, uh, I'd like to explain it in English. I think I think the closest to it would be that the person is manipulative or the person is troublesome. I don't know how to say it in English, but I know how to use it. And so now that I know that a lot of people don't understand it, I would use another word that is fitting to whatever the circumstance is. Envious, okay, thank you. Envious candles, it could also mean envious. Uh, I usually use it for people that are monarchic, hypocritical, I think that's it. I usually use it for hypocritical people. And you know, the things, the, money, the gaslighting and all those nonsense that you do. So, the, you, uh, and I learned recently that most people don't use the word because it probably just those of us from across, those of us close to the Niger that use it. So getting it right. Now that we know the things that you're getting wrong, let's talk about how we can begin to get it right. And the first one, the first point is one of my favorite topic to talk about. The first step to get it right is to understand yourself. Yes, understand yourself. I know that you're trying to talk to your boss. You're trying to talk to your husband or your children. Why is it that you have to understand yourself? You need to understand yourself and how you are, are, be, are being a barrier or is being a barrier in your communication. How are you standing in the way? What are your limitations as a communicator? What are your weaknesses as a communicator? What are the strengths that you can leverage on? So let me give you an example. My biggest strength is that I can talk well. I can talk. My biggest weakness is that I talk too much. So my biggest strength and my weakness, they're actually the same thing. So I, I can talk well. I'm not afraid to talk. Talk is easy for me. Now it's the weakness in communication because I will talk, 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 do a necessary roundabout, something that is not necessary. We had to join it, explain, give you uh, what the Quran said about even the Bible mentioned it, this, 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 this. I just have the natural tendency to draw on and on and on and on and the person is rolling his eyes looking at me like please get straight to the point <laughs> and because i like to go round about sometimes i over i nag i used to i don't nag anymore it doesn't make any sense to nag i would either be nagging or be ranting. I think that's what I do. I literally just rant every time. I am ranting every time. Like any small thing, I'm ranting. And it can be very, very frustrating. And it is something that really dents relationships. And you're ranting and ranting. And because now I am in um, in a in a situation where you know I know how to stop ranting and then I've also learned and then the people around me have also also learned to just give me the sign like could you just go straight to the point and so, uh, so in the last couple of years I've learned to just go straight to the point I'm so straightforward and people will say ah, ah, you're always so straightforward I'm sorry if you let me sugarcoat it I will go on and on and on so now let us sugarcoat it this is what I want to say and we begin to talk about the plot solutions now so you need to understand yourself what are your limitations so for me 
mine is tough. Your own could be the opposite of it. I have a friend who has an aversion for confrontation. She doesn't want to confront you. She, and then, you know, the bad sad thing is that she actually would tell somebody else to come and confront you on a behalf. And it used to annoy me because for me, that is theater. What that means is that you and I have a problem. Tell me, why are you telling somebody else? Do you want the person to have a problem with me? Are you trying to cause more problem between us? That is hypocritical. Full stop from the way I see it. But it was, it's not that. She grew up in a, in a polygamous home where keeping peace is very sensitive. So they, I, apparently maybe somebody raised them to not confront each other. So every time, they they need to go through their father who will now say it in a very nice way so that they will not be fine. I come from a home where see if it happens, just say it as it happened. No, don't come and be put in your chest. I, I don't keep malice. If you keep malice, I just keep it for yourself because this is where I would look at it for one week, like I don't care. And that's the way I was. And I do it, I used to do it for her a lot. The moment you start wearing face. Me to step. I don't say. I went to a boarding house with 1,500 people. Do you think it's easy to survive that by caring, you carrying mood? If you have anything to say, say it. If you don't say it, we move. So for me, that was also an attitude I had to learn. So sometimes when I see it, I let myself care and say, okay, what did I do? It's hard for me though, because I don't want to care. <laughs> so you need to understand yourself and the things that you have that is holding back. Uh, effective communication in your relationships and in your communication generally. Uh, it could be your shyness, it could be your aggressive, your aggression, it could be certain triggers that every time you see it, it just triggers you, triggers something, something inside you. It could actually be a certain pain in you that you need to overcome. It could be traumatic experience from childhood that you need to find healing from. It could be physiological barriers like your hearing or your eyesight or headaches. You know, I know people that don't like to talk, like you just talking this long, they would have edits. So you need to know who you are and how you communicate. If it is not effective enough, what are the things that are affecting? What are your shortcomings? What are your limitations? And how can you start improving on those? Because well, I, if we all decide to improve ourselves first, all our relationships and our communication will get better. Forget about your partner, forget about your boss, forget about your staff, you. First, improve yourself first, and you'll be shocked at how much progress there will be in your relationship. The next point is to understand your audience. So when you're done understanding yourself, and one key point for me in understanding ourselves is that Aristotle said that the understanding of self is the beginning of wisdom. The moment you understand yourself, and you get yourself, and you understand that everybody cannot be like you, you get to come and understand your audience better too. Now, understanding your audience is one of the is the core is at the core of communication. You cannot effectively communicate in any form without understanding who your audience is, who your audience is. You must understand who you're speaking to, how they want to listen, how they want to be spoken to, how they listen. So, let me use an example uh, of women in marriages, for instance, women. When you marry somebody, you know, I think our mothers may not be necessarily guilty of this or even our grandmothers. Because our grandmothers went into marriages, their marriages knowing they're marrying a king. And so they go to speak to him like a king, like a boss. So a lot of us in this generation, we're not marrying bosses, we're marrying our partners. And that's how we talk to them. And here's the truth. Yes, they are your partner. They are, I hope so. But a lot of men are not actually raised to listen like your partner. They actually listen like king of the house, king of the jungle. So every time you're like, you know, people want to say bye now, you are disrespecting him. You are already, that's a barrier. The use of language is a barrier. He doesn't care anymore. What he's hearing is this woman is disrespecting him again. So you keep saying it. Why do you put your clothes here? Why do you put your clothes here? And sometimes some of us even go so bad that we talk to our husbands the way we talk to our children. Like the way you, you correct your husband is the way you correct your son. In fact, the man even saw you carrying the same tone with that boy, the same tone with him, in practically the same breath, or even an hour apart. And so you are treating a grown-up man the same way you will talk to a toddler 
and you're wondering why the man never listens. And that's the same thing with men too. Just because she's your wife doesn't mean she's beneath you. You keep correcting her like she's your junior sister or she's your slave or she's your staff. She's not your staff, she's your wife. And you must recognize that and understand that they are she, she's listening as your wife. You are speaking to her as your slave. She's not hearing you because she's already angry by the tone you're carrying. And one of the things you must understand by tone and body language is that in communication, 70% of what you're saying is the words. The words, they're just seven percent. So if you say, I've been saying this thing for the past seven days, yes, that's just seven percent. Seven, seven percent out of seven out of hundred. What happened to the 93 rebellion? 13 percent is the tone, 80 percent is your body language. So, yes, you are telling me, madam, I don't want egg or whatever it is you call it, or whatever it is you don't want. You must understand that you are talking to me as if I'm your house girl. I'm not your house girl. I'm your wife. You must say it with some respect. You must say it with that understanding. Don't come and talk to me as if what? <laughs> so understanding your this is key. The way the person listens, the way the person hears. So for me, if when I'm talking to my business advisor, for instance, I know that I cannot be doing it by explanation. The guy will just give me the look or get straight to the point or to the day. So maybe I, if I even go into that conversation that I have to do like every other month, I would have already written down all the things that I'm struggling with, all the things, this, this, this. And then I go straight because that's the way the person listens. He doesn't have time for long, long, long. And you see, when I'm talking to one of my friends, you know, if I say, can he, I say it in one sentence, you'll be like, ah, uh -uh, now give me all the gist now, give me all the background, you know, share how the apple, and hey, and that's the way I talk to her. So you must know who you're talking to, you must understand your audience, it is important to understand your audience and their natural tendencies, their motivations, their goals, their challenges, and their opportunities, it is fully, if you truly, truly want to be an effective communicator. The next point is to have a goal in mind. Have a goal in mind. Who we'll go into a conversation that I'm just going to say my mind? To achieve what? To what end do you want to say your mind? Like, I'm going to say my mind. Say your mind, but wait. Don't say, so when you now say your mind, what now happen? I don't care. Anything can just happen. No, you must care. You must have a goal in mind. I want to say my mind. I want to tell this brother to stop putting his clothes on the floor because I'm tired. Of fully, I'm tired of picking clothes on the floor. So the goal is I need him to stop doing it. Because when you have a goal, it's easier to devise a strategy. So I've been telling this guy for two weeks that the laundry basket is right here. Why is your clothes quite two feet away? And then he keeps doing that all the time. So I'm going to stand up to him. Mm. Okay, maybe I'll put the basket here. And then <laughs> shoot the basket there and the clothes are where the baskets used to be. You know that what comes to mind is that if you're going to hit his head on the wall, but I'm not going to do that. We're going to have a family meeting. Why are you throwing your, basket, your clothes on your floor? I need you to understand that it is active for you to keep picking it. And the children, hey, keep, let, let me recognize what I'm going to say. You see, if you keep putting your, basket, your clothes there, well, the day that your ch children come up for a book, they got a pop a more that will not wash out. <laughs> I beat you. <laughs> I'm going to actually motivate him by scaring him, by saying that that your T and M shirt that you want to kill yourself where you bought it. Well, when they pop a more on it, you will know. I'm telling you, the brother will stop putting his clothes on the floor. Because you need to understand, because the goal for me is that that shirt needs to stop being dropped at that particular point. The goal for me is that it's not that the man should stop acting, frustrating my life, because maybe he's not even doing it to frustrate my life. I just want, I don't want to see clothes there. So I'm willing to do anything, even if it's to go on my knees, if that is what will be required. So when you know the goal, you will do what is required. You want, your, you want your staff to stop doing something, you're always shouting, you're always shouting. You've been shouting for one year. The girl is still not doing anything. In fact, I had a staff like that. Apparently, the girl had ADHD. So I can shout from now to tomorrow. She's not here. She has forgotten 10 minutes after. 
to what did you think I did? I stopped shouting. Whenever I needed her to do something, I write it down and give it to her. Go and paste it on your work desk. While you're working on it, continue to use this to remind yourself. The last three months she worked with me, that's what I kept doing. I will not, I will not tell her because she will forget. So I will write it down. Yeah. I need you to do this in the exact place I put it, in this exact way. And it got better. Was it annoying that I had to be using sticky notes for my assistant? Yes. However, it was the only way to get my job done. So I have a goal in mind. And one thing you must know that the goal must always be bigger than your ego. It is not about your emotions, it's not about your feel. Focus on what you want achieved. What I want achieved is that I need her to do something that I know she can do. The only reason she keeps making a mistake is because she has, a, she has an attention problem, which is fine. So how, do, so how will I make sure that she does what I know she can do? Is by helping her cut out the attention problem. And writing a note and telling her to stick it to her table may be a long route to go about it. It may not make sense to you. I can a 22-year-old be forgetful like a toddler. Well, that one is family history. The situation is what we have right now is that she doesn't listen because she no, she doesn't remember things. She forgets things easily because she has ADHD and she can't help it. It doesn't have a cure. She's not doing it intentionally. The goal is that she should do her work. So what do I, how do I communicate to ensure that the work is done? Because that's the goal. So I would write sticky note for her every day. So have a goal in mind. Don't just say it. It's foolish to say it for when Muslims post before we're anything, a Muslim is a very intentional person. You don't just say things for the sake of saying. When the Prophet was going to ask Allah for Umar, he had an agenda. He was a very intentional person, a very calculated person. He looked at his team and thought, I need to strengthen this team. And I need somebody with the strength of Umar or Abu Jal. What did he do? He prayed to Allah and asked Allah for it. He didn't say, like, oh, Allah, shall give me somebody that can do this thing? Let, no, there was a goal in mind, and he had a picture of somebody who could do it. And that was because he even had clarity of the goal. So you must have clarity. Why are you arguing every night? Why? What's the goal? Then listen actively. Now, this is supposed to be the heart of the conversation. Listen actively. A lot of us don't listen. We, don't, we are not in conversations to listen. We just, in the moment, uh -huh, I know that that's what you want to say. You don't know what they want to say. Even if you are right, you need to listen because they will not even say the way you are going to say. They're not looking at the world the way you are looking at it. So let them tell you, let them show you. Most of us have wrecked our jobs, we've wrecked our work relationship, we've wrecked our businesses with our customers, and unfortunately, even marriages and relationship with our children because we don't listen. I know I've wrecked a business partnership because I don't listen. I lost a lot of money. And my partner kept saying, you don't listen, you don't listen. And at that point, too, it was a lesson. It was a hard lesson. So I kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I think that was it. it the camera's back was already broken. <laughs> listen actively. Listening is usually, it is very, very important. I know that we're talking about you talking, but there's nothing like understanding yourself. Uh, sorry, this chat has come with me. Listen actively. So what are the things you need to consider for active listening? The following are the active listening skills that you need to work on. Uh, you need to take, listen to understand. Don't listen to respond. Don't listen to reply. Don't listen to give feedback. Just listen. See, even if you will eventually respond, Listen to understand the exact thing the person is trying to say so that you can, you can respond appropriately. It's not like, eh, eh, that's how you always want to say all the time. Eh, I know. And then the person shut up. And I think women have this problem in marriages or in relationships. I'll be like, the man doesn't talk to me. And every time I've asked them to go talk to, ask their husbands or, why don't you talk to me? The same answer keeps coming back because you don't listen. Because I tried to tell you the last time, and then she, the moment the time is, I tried to tell you, but that last time, you know, do. Ask, another thing is to listen to understand, ask deeper questions. Stop asking unnecessary. <laughs> Especially, 
on WhatsApp group. I see you people. We'll be talking about something one thing. You'll be asking about another thing that has nothing to do with anything. Ask deeper questions. Ask questions that will make you better understand. Ask questions that will heal whatever misunderstanding is between you. Stop asking, eh, hey, so that's how you now feel about me, Abby. And hey, she's all these days. So that's what you're thinking about. You. What is thinking about you studies this? Days? It's not the point. Listen to that thing and what you should do about it. It is a feedback. And what we do with feedback is to improve with it. If you're not saying, hey, so that's how you think. Oh, how can you think it? That's how it is. Okay, can we get to the point? Avoid the interruption. Don't say, I know what you want to say. No, 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 you don't know what you want to say. Let him finish. Let him finish. Take non barbecues. Non barbecues. Some people, they'll be talking to us. We're, we're saying something, and the person is already, the face has changed. We know we are hurt. I don't know whether you know you're hurting. So you're talking to me, and like, hey, Muti, I don't want to offend you, but and my face is already looking offended. Can you just shut up and stop talking? But no, you will continue. Or the person is talking and the person is looking hurt and then you are angry. What audacity do they have to be saying that to you? The person looks hurt and you're angry that they have the audacity to say to you. You're not recognizing the fact that they are actually not only communicating words to you, which is just 70%, 7%, they are actually communicating emotions to you. They are telling you, this person is letting herself or himself be vulnerable to you. And you don't see that what you see is the audacity that they, they have the courage to say it. Then slow down and practice silence. Practice silence. When I learned to find solace in silence, we, when I'm sitting with the people that I care about, I realized that, oh, I've grown so much. I don't, we, a lot of us are comf uncomfortably, we are uncomfortable with silence. When there's silence, we're like, ah, maybe something's happening. Maybe the person is doing something. Maybe, 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 there's no maybe. Just slow down and find, find solace in silence. Sometimes silence is the best. In fact, sometimes when you actually keep quiet, or you let silence do it, you actually hear what you have not been hearing. You, if I have learned to draw myself and improve a certain relationship from the two of us giving ourselves space. And in that silence, I have learned to see all my mistakes and the things I could do better. And then we've actually been able to grow from taking that space. That space was forced though, I didn't make it. It was forced for me, and it, I, it was bad. It was it hurt me, but I'm looking at it as a blessing because it gave us time to actually listen to all the words that have been said that we didn't hear. Train your mind to not be distracted. Distraction is a big deal. Some of us, we are somebody saying something, and then we're looking. We're already thinking about another thing. You need to train your mind to not be distracted. And lastly, it holds judgment. Samaria might have three minutes, don't worry, I am almost done. I would have to rush the other ones. <laughs> so uh, the next one is to keep it simple. Please, I, I think I mentioned that about me having the ability to go on and on and on, just keep it simple. I like this to be done this way. Could you please do it that way? Don't tell stories, ah, this is all I want to do it in 1987. Keep it simple. Concise messages can be delivered quickly and they are more powerful than long stories. I find, as my in my job as MC, I found that Nigerians just have to complicate conversation. They want to ask one question, they will first give you background. Can you go ahead? And when I tell them, please, can you go straight to the question? No, 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 I have to explain the background. You don't have to explain the background. Just go ask the question. If I need clarity, I would ask. Just tell me what the question is. Keep it simple. The next one is to find a perfect time. Timing is crucial. Don't be calling me. Somebody is actually calling me right now. And I want to discuss what? I put this poster everywhere. And everybody should know that I am busy from 11 to zoo. And then somebody is calling me and they will say, ah, every time I call you, you don't even peep. You're always busy. Even my own parents know that they can't call me certain times. It is always busy. And they're not offended. So why are you offended? A good idea is only good when it comes at the right time. Timing is crucial. Find the right medium. So you have found the right time. What is the medium like? Correcting your husband in front of your children, 
may not necessarily be a good time to do it. Doing it over the phone when he's at work, now that's terrible. And that's what I'm going to say about it. Find the right medium, context about where and how your communication is being consumed is a vital factor to consider. The context, some people don't talk on the phone. They don't talk on the phone. Me, I'm very good at writing a piece too. But then I have a few people who don't like epistles. And then I always say epistle coming, they would rather do face to face. So the right medium would also be determined by a lot of factors, including you, the way you communicate effectively, the way your list, the audience likes to hear it, etc. etc. Mind your non-verbal cues. Mind your non-verbal cues. Non-verbal cues is basically your body language. You can't say sorry to me with a frown or with a smirk and think I would accept it. Why are you smirking? And have I, have I not said it? Yes, you've said it, but that's just, the words are just some percent. 80% of it is the, face, the way your face look. So sometimes you feel like the person is not listening to you. They didn't accept your apology. They didn't forgive you. They didn't even pay attention to what you said. It could be that your body language was saying the opposite of what you intended. So you should mind your non verbal cues. Lastly, be open to feedback. Be open to feedback. Feedback is difficult. I don't want anybody calling me talkative because it is actually, but the truth is that it is a feedback. You must be open to feedback. And this is why a lot of communication breaks because the moment the other person starts to say, eh, but you now, you now get angry. We see feedback as criticism all the time. It is not, they're two separate things. In fact, for me, even criticism is a feedback. And there, you know, I have an entire class on this where we talk about what, how to listen to criticism. And the, quite the simple thing is you do two things with criticism. One thing actually, accept that it's feedback. Now there are two things you do with feedback, two things. You either analyze it to take the lesson so that you can be a better person or you throw it away. Simple. If it is not making you better, throw it away. If it is hurting your self-esteem, throw it away. If it is a verbal abuse, the person is just doing transfer aggression, throw it away. If the person is using you to boost their own self-esteem, self you throw it away. If it is not making you better, don't then throw it away. Now, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. It's not like your wife keeps telling you, guy, you keep doing this, you keep that. Like, why are you always salty? Why are you always salty? Well, this I should be throwing it away. No. I'm not saying you should throw that away. You should actually listen to what she's trying to say. Listen to the emotions, listen to the words, listen to what she's trying to say. She's giving you a feedback. Every rant, every nag is a feedback. And if she's become a naga or nago, like my sister and I like to call it, it is because you have not listened the first time she said it. So a, nag, a nagging wife is a feedback. And what do you do with feedback? set a goal to make her stop nagging. How do you stop her nagging? How do you stop her nagging? Stop doing what she's doing. What, stop doing what she's saying you're doing. So criticism and feedback, they are hard to take because we're not wired to listen to corrections. We're not, you know, there's a lot of things going on around us. But for life, when you get to a point where you're comfortable with, okay, so what did I do? Okay, so what do you think I can do to make this better for you? And the person tells you, like, okay, I can't, these three things, eh, I can't achieve all of them in the next one month. So then can we just take it step by step? That's a better way to look at it than and say, I cannot change. This is the way I am. If you don't take me like this, then leave me alone. That's not good. You're Muslim. You're Muslim first. Muslim is in a constant journey of self-development. And if you are going to be principled and rigid, I don't know what religion you are, worship, you are doing or whose God you are worshiping, but our is a religion of becoming better. Once and once evidence is given to you, then you work on it. So in conclusion, listening skill is key to all effective communication. Without the ability to listen effectively, messages are easily misunderstood. And I have shared with you the barriers that affect the way you listen to words. And also, and also share with you what we need to start working on in order to improve them. I pray that Allah in his infinite mercy uh, bless what I've shared and make it uh, beneficial knowledge for you in this life and after all, so that you're not hiring for your time. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.